Hello and welcome to IABM TV. Uh, I'm Lorenzo Zanni, Head of Insight and Analysis uh, at the IABM. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, trends in content creation and we are joined by Jeremy Young, uh, CEO of uh, Atomos, David Ross, CEO of Ross Video, and Philippe Brodeur, CEO of uh, Overcast HQ. So let me start from a very general question, starting from you, Jeremy. Yes. Um, what, what do you see as the main drivers of change in your segment in content creation? Uh, yeah, it's the, you know, the, the adjustment from a limited brightness and color range specification of SDR Rec 709 into how to change their shooting techniques and their editing workflows and, and their live production workflows for that change and that it's evolving has evolved very quickly and there wasn't many standards three or four years ago now there's standards we've been working on those standards for a long time so we feel like we're in a good position to meet those needs but the, the changes are coming from that change from SDR to HDR yeah, yeah. thanks for that David uh, we see a lot of changes uh, both in the marketplace and in technology uh, and it's an interesting combination because Technology, you, you see people working in HD, you see, you see them working in 4K, you might see a couple still working in standard def definition, <laughs> we feel sorry for them. Uh, you see them wanting HDR or not HDR and mixing matching it the way they want. They, you see some with 2110, you see some moving to NDI, uh, and of course they're all right. Uh, <laughs> on top for of them, that, yes. <laughs> on top of that you see uh, broadcasters consolidating and having less money and worrying about workflow and at the same time uh, have, uh, grappling with this change and and uh, dealing with some technologies that may be quite expensive for them. Thanks for that, Philip. So, from our point of view, the the, the biggest change is around su uh, supply chain and the number of people who are being enabled to get into the supply chain now who are non-technical. So, uh, video production, TV production, whatever you want to call it. Uh, is being democratized and and frankly uh, you know we can automate so many of the processes now that people who have a very limited audiovisual skill set can now start to take part in the, in the actual creation process and that makes a big big change in terms of who can manage the content who can uh, create the content and who can push the content out. yeah thanks for that uh, David um of course, we see a lot of investment uh, in content creation, but at the same time, a lot of competition in your segment. How, how do you manage that uh, uh, with customers that are requesting you to add new functionalities uh, uh, to your offering uh, constantly? Hmm. Well, it's, it's a challenge because, uh, like what we were talking about before, there's so many different types of video formats just just to begin with, let alone uh, all the different ways that they want to do. Whether you know, uh, working in technology with cloud and GPU and CPU processing, FPGA processing, and, and each one having different requirements. Uh, we're hiring something like 70 engineers this year just okay. to, uh, to keep up with the demand, and at the same time, we, we have to figure out how our product lines can find commonality to be able to, uh, to do that as efficiently as possible while spanning all of the needs of our customers. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite a challenge. Okay. Uh, Jeremy? Um, yeah, I would, I would say that the toughest part is to have the vision of prediction you know, a couple of years down the track. And you never get it really right, but you can point yourself in the right direction and then, as you're alluding to, resource up. Um, and what happens with those new evolutions, like for example, we didn't really need to worry about colour scientists because it was all Rec 709 yeah. and it was all standard stuff. Oh, the good old days. Yeah, the good old <laughs> days. Now, you really need to understand how to transform logs to PQ and how to and do that in lots of different ways, um, it's a whole different skill set. Now, the computer world's been dealing with that in lots of different ways, it, even in, especially in post-production at a software level for a long time. And so a lot, it, the interesting merging of imaging, production, and computer yeah. is very exciting. I'm from the computer world, so we see ourselves as a computer kind of tech company just playing in imaging. And there's a lot of these skills really coming, becoming important at the, at the front end. And um, that's what we're, you know, pursuing and trying to pick the future. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, thanks for that. Uh, Philip, you mentioned also the, the cloud. Uh, let's have a look at also specific technologies in content creation. Uh, how do you see the adoption of the cloud uh, at the moment in, in our industry? So I think cloud uh, it is, a, is, a, is a perfect hybrid solution for uh, what, it, what has traditionally been an on-premise solution. Yeah. So what we see at the moment, and we're, we're AWS partners and, and we're working 
uh, with Elemental to try and, uh, you know, like I said, bring as many uh, non-technical people into the supply chain as possible. So what we can do with the cloud is we can automate a lot of things uh, like, you know, standard post um, uh, chores is what they used to be, which would be transcoding or adding subtitles or image recognition or even search. Uh, and and by, by using uh, cloud solutions, we can distribute that among a whole slew of different premises, make it easier for people to work in, in different places. Yeah. Uh, and, and frankly, what that's doing is, is now that the non-technical people can get involved in it, they're, they're starting to create more content themselves simply by having access to the content. So image recognition, take image recognition. By being able to sit there and search through my library for bicycles, for example, all of a sudden that can trigger an idea for some content that I may want to create around bicycles for whatever, the, some bike anniversary coming up or whatever, whatever that may be. And, uh, and that really is changing um, how, uh, you know, the, the, that, that, that gap between capacity and demand and being able to create uh, the, 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 the content that demand is, is, uh, is demanding. So flexibility. David, Jeremy, if you want to chip in on the cloud as well. Sure. Uh, well, yeah, we have, we have quite a bit of work going on in the cloud as well. Certainly for, for large events, uh, it, yeah. the cloud has been amazing. I mean, if you're doing the Olympics and say you need a, an enormous newsroom system that is gonna, just going to be there for a couple of weeks and then disappears again, Instead of setting up a network and servers and all the permissions and everything else, you just trucks and trucks and trucks yeah, coming exactly. in. Yeah, you just log yeah. in, you get it done, and you're and, and you're out. So there's a lot of people that like that. Uh, at the same time, uh, in day-to-day -day use, in a lot of places, we see a mistrust of the cloud, and and you know there's issues of security, reliability. Yeah. You know what happens if my connection goes down? Is my news completely gone? Uh, so uh, there's uh, there's probably some truth to that uh, as, as, as a concern, mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, uh, it's a real opportunity going forward. Yeah. At the same time, you know, when you're talking about cloud in the content creation business, there's one side which is just the, the management of, of data, you know, things like a newsroom system or, or a, a media asset management yeah. and things like that. Working with video is a whole nother story, and uh, and being able to to, to virtualize uh, the the video flow is is kind of a dream that we all have right now. Mm. But the the cloud's not quite ready for us not at the same good. time. But there's customers that if they could have it, they, they they would love it, and it's a real challenge for us, I think, to to keep up with this. And you have people trying to do things with NDI because you've got not just the processing, but the bandwidth within the cloud at the same time. But then other people said, well, I don't want to do that. I want 2110. And then you see elements of the cloud just choking on, on, on that. On 40 almost. gig uploads and stuff like oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the connections that sometimes people say yeah, you're are It's unsustainable, right? Yes. It's, so, a, it's a big challenge. So we, we've got a ways to go. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting what you say about security as well, because according to our research, uh, that's that remains the top uh, concern. Well, that's their asset, it's, yeah. the, it's, it's the video, but also being able to control what's happening. The last thing you want to do is have your newscast hacked. Yeah. Uh, I, and look, my opinion on the, on the you know, utilization of, when you talk about cloud, you're talking about um, enabling you know, boring tasks to be <laughs> automated. Yeah. Um, and you're also then, hopefully, becoming more and more accurate yeah. as Right now, you're right, it's not quite there yet. But machine learning and deep learning is all about, and you know, people got lots of different things, AI, machine learning, deep learning, yeah. neural networks, it's all the same, in the assistive yeah. techniques to yeah. apply. And the people in the right position to define the right workflow and the way that that can really find, if you look at AI engines today, you look for bicycle, it'll be pretty good. You look for bicycles, it'll start to chunk a bit if you haven't learned it properly. If you look sure. for bicycles and flowers and Right, it's starting to get really hard. You need a lot of metadata. We're very focused on enabling that down the track, handing it over to you with lens data, color matrix data, position data, object starting to recognize, give you a starting point, give you some information from the project, things that a people learns that help the machine be more accurate. Yeah. And I think if we can all work together from capture right through to delivery, 
and work out maybe a couple of segments. You know, some of them are NDI at one gig, they might go to 10 and then we'll go 40 gig and we'll work out how much more we can do with that. Your cloud stuff is going to need to take this bandwidth or do we proxy it up and move it up? So there's a lot of technical challenges, but the people in the right position yeah. to do it for this industry are, are the people sitting here and, you know, multiple other people yeah. at NAB. No, it's just us. No, it's just us, that's right. Yeah, let's, let's just dominate. That's a good idea. I like dominating. <laughs> Don't you do too, I see. Uh, on, the, on, the flip, on the flip side of that, in other markets where you can see, you know, other industries, yeah. who's in the best position to do it for automotive? Yeah, it is BMW and Mercedes and, you know, the forefront leaders. And as long as they jump on it, yeah. then we'll get a great solution. It's when they're not jumping on it and I see camera makers not really jumping on it. Nope. I see you know people in, in your infrastructure world that aren't jumping on it. True. Um, and therefore, they're going to put rubbish solutions out there. Yeah. And I've experienced it with HDR. No one thought that it was possible to do it properly. We did it properly. We've got a reputation for that now. But there were so many people who did it wrong at the start that gave it a bad reputation. If I come and search and it's wrong, I'm not going to trust that again. No, I get that, but I mean, the thing is that, you know, if you, if you always have to go back to a librarian to search for <laughs> yeah, it, that's then, not good either. that's not good either. So, you know, you see things like, like Netflix is 100% in the cloud. Now, yeah. Right? Playout is moving to the cloud. Broadcast has been slow to move to the cloud for a whole slew of reasons, yeah, yeah. you're right. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we always break out, and that's transit and cloud. Okay, so transit, yeah, there's challenges around transit, moving up and moving down. That's, 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 that's content in transit. Content in cloud, very different solution, right? There's a lot of things that go on there, like for example, rendering. It doesn't make any sense to do rendering anywhere but in the cloud yeah. now because you can spin Sufficient. up and spin down mm -hmm. so quickly. Uh, like your, your uh, Olympics example as well. There's no reason why you wouldn't do that in, in, a, in, in, a, in a cloud situation. Um, yeah, you know, uh, getting, getting hacked, that's not good. Nobody wants Yeah, that. and so therefore the security, what are those risks? We're in the best place to talk to our customers about it and find out what specifically they're really concerned about. Yeah. And then we can implement it. So if I did, let's say, uh, an AES 256-bit encryption, mm -hmm. we defined that it was these keys. We have a program to let other partners, you know, together as a group, maybe an IBM group that mm. might, you know, support yeah. a standard or something. That'd be good, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, then, then we could kind of solve that problem pretty fast. It might take a bit of time to get that organization going, but it's better than me coming up with one, you coming up with one, and you coming up with one to sure. meet a certain yeah. customer's needs. Yeah. 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 Actually, one of the things that's interesting about the cloud is, is when broadcast meets the IT group. Yeah. And the IT group is far more rigid than, than broadcast engineering ever is. And, and it's interesting when you create a system that is more of a, a software-based system and there's a lot of networking required and it starts to go into you know, the corporate server mm. world, it, it, it seems to almost break down. It, it, the change is glacial, uh, approvals are required, yeah. uh, things that are common sense in broadcast just are, are unheard of mm. in the other side. It's interesting that well, you have the security aspect in the cloud, and you've got the connect connection you need to make. There's a lot of people that just say, you know, I would prefer to have it in the cloud than have to deal with my own IT group to 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 solve some of these problems on prem. Yeah, because it becomes a headache, right? Yeah, it, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and of course you mentioned AI and machine learning. You mentioned yeah. automation and the fact that uh, media companies uh, are really much uh, focused on efficiency at the moment. Mm. So let's talk a lot a little bit about automation, starting from you, David. Um, how far can this go in content creation from your perspective? I think it, 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 go, it goes in, incredibly far. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, if you're doing something like, like doing a newscast now, you can do it with, with one or two people uh, from the point of view of uh, the, 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 like what we have with our, our Overdrive product line. Uh, so, so that's good. Now what you're seeing more is the automation of cameras. And uh, there's some some very interesting technologies that yeah. are, uh, are showing up over there. I think you know, obviously you're, well, I was going to say obviously you're always going to have people involved, but yeah. you know what? We're actually seeing some some productions where, where you know you'll see an entire ten tennis show where there's no camera people, there's no direction, you just set it up and away it goes. And That's how much more people input was required to get to that point well, compared to if there were people on the on the set? So does the 
lead up time to the production and the input become much greater, or do you think it's? I think it was the definition. Just of the getting system. rid of the people. The definition of the <laughs> systems themselves, and you set up the rules, and in some cases that works. Now that's at the very basic level. Yeah, of course. And yeah. that that's some of what you're talking about is democratizing production. Mm -hmm. You can have every single tennis game on the planet suddenly be done as long as you're willing to have you know an automated system mm -hmm. in place there, and that's not something we even do yet. Uh, but uh, we're in a good position to know what to do, right? <laughs> for that automation, yeah. But uh, but there's other things at the higher end performance, and and, and you know where where you suddenly want to be able to catch a face in a crowd, get a reaction from from a coach, yeah. Uh, and that moment where something goes wrong, you know, on the field, that that's where you still need to have people, uh, and I think you always will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want introversion. And Philip, you mentioned this as well, uh, automation. How do you see this in content creation? Well, I think the. Uh, you know, the, the 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 last thing to change are uh, are the workflows and supply chains because you have to have belief and and exposure to the cloud before you can actually start to see the, cha the changes in the workflow. So I mean, one uh, you talk about newsrooms, and I worked in news for for 25 years. Um, it's still incredibly analog uh, way of working. I think it's it, it's amazing. So for example, I, I you know been into a couple of newsrooms recently, and just asking them how they how they manage, uh, you know, legaling some of the some of the stories that they need to get legal, yeah. and they're still sending it on a on a on a on a key to someone uh, who's plugging it in, and they're getting an email back, which is in no way connected to that actual asset itself. Whereas, uh, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a, a solution which can be you know, where you can you can send someone a direct link, and it, it would have to be some sort of. A, I mean, cloud's just another word for a a, a, a server that's somewhere that, that more people. Hardware more. in the desert. Yeah, there, there you go. There you go. The more, <laughs> the, the hardware in the desert. I like that. That's good. That's good. Um, or some. It needs to be cold too. That that's right. Good. That's right. Hard, hardware in Ireland, which is where I live at the moment, right? And uh, and yeah. So you know, you, what you really want to do is have that metadata associated with that asset forever yeah. and ever, and. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's just one very simple uh, workflow which can, which can easily change and make a big difference going forward. So you know, rights management, that's going to change. You see a lot of, you see a lot of these uh, workflows which are uh, you know, still fairly analog. We still go down to an edit suite for a big reveal to see you know, a latest piece of content being yeah. created. Um, you know, that's not, that's, as things speed up, uh, more demand for con content comes. And I'm not talking the you know the necessarily uh, the the big events, right? It's just more wallpaper. It's all that extra content that just needs to fill all the different channels. That stuff needs to get pushed out much much faster than it is at the moment. And the cloud certainly enables a lot of that. So after the show, you have to tell me who that customer is. They need Ross Inception. <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> We, we talked a lot about efficiency, automation. Mm -hmm. Let's move the conversation a little bit on quality. Yes. Uh, what about UHD? How do you see the adoption of UHD in content creation? Yeah, huge. I mean, we've sold 500,000 monitor recorders and 300,000 of them are 4K. Um, it's, it's there already. Uh, I think, you know, when you're at the stage we're at, which is those production crews jumping onto things so that two years later they can sell their content or it's not irrelevant. So they've got to jump on early. Yeah. Um, so I mean, our first 4K product was 2014. Um, it was 4K30, and then we went 4K60 in 2016. Um, and now we're showing, you know, million to one contrast ratio screens. We're recording raw at much higher data rates. So it's advancing. Yeah. The competing interest is the automation can't really happen on that footage. Yeah. Right. So we have to be transcoding it with some decisions already made, um, and. You know, just trying to merge that, just in my mind, the two things that we've been talking about, the automation and the quality. You need to keep both, yeah. but you can't apply the same procedures and policies to both. They're kind of two different beasts. And to maintain the quality, you, can you, you kind of need to isolate. Like these guys are like, I'm in the edit suite, I know that this is graded properly, I'm playing this one for my customers, yeah. right? That's something that they still need to have the confidence in, yeah. and that's what kind of our end of the world does. And then how it flows through, and your kind of big quality infrastructure into that big production kind of live phase and all that kind of stuff. And then once it gets to you, you can't take those uncompressed files we're pumping around SDI 
around no. a set, right? No. And or on a stadium or something like that. So quality at the time and at the capture point is super important. What happens after that? You want to roll out transcoded lower quality or lower bandwidth to do the AI and all the stuff on it, and then you kind of reconform back to the high quality for whatever purpose, whether it be a you know entertainment production that you need super high quality in a theater or a big TV at home, or if you're watching it on a phone in a social environment, probably all right to go to the H.265, right? So there's those different, the quality needs to be at the start and the finish. Yeah. What happens in the middle is, you know, up up to the customer to make sure that they trust yeah. that that is going to get them to the end. Interesting link between quality and efficiency. Mm -hmm. David? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I live in the middle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and it, it's interesting uh, on the IMAG side of things, you know, whether it's a sports stadium or, a, you know, a big event, a big screen, 4K is, is, uh, is a big deal and because uh, it, they're not transmitting. They're try just trying to make a really good picture for their mm. customers right then and there. Uh, in, in broadcast, it's a different world because there's no legislation that says that they have to go to 4K. Yeah. So, so in, in that world, they're trying to, uh, and they're getting squeezed, so they're not as likely to want to go to 4K and actually do the production. And at the same time, uh, I think that there's a, a bit of confusion in the marketplace because they, they've gotten to, to where they are typically using SDI. Yeah. And now to go to 4K, they can go to 12 gig SDI and that's one way, but then they're also worried about going to I to to 2110. Uh -huh. yeah. And if they go to 2110, if you ask them two years ago, you know, three years ago, they said they're going to do well. They'd, say, they'd have used Aspen, and then they'd have used 2022-6, and then they'd have used 2110. But it would have been 10 gig 2110, not 40 gig. And, and yeah, yeah. Well, not, yeah, yeah, 40 gig, but that's just four tens, and yeah. so and people don't even know that out that's there. That's correct. And, and, yeah. And so now it's 25, and and hopefully by the and manufacturers are actually building equipment that is obsolete before they can actually make their money back and, and so then you've got customers that are saying do I go do I go to IP but but NMOS isn't even completely done yet and I'm scared to do that but then there's 10 gig and other manufacturers are saying no you don't want to go to SDI ever yeah. and, mm. and and so I think it slows down the adoption of we 4k did, yeah. meanwhile though even if they're buying HD products whatever they're gonna buy they demand 4K because because they fear, they're afraid they're going to need it next. Yeah, the ob yeah. The, they're so, they're recording obsolete material exactly. off the bat, and, yeah. and, and and so you end up even if it's not going to be used, and they choose a format, you have to provide them with 4K or a path to 4K, even if they're not going to use it. Mm. Potentially, even in the generation of equipment that you just get sold them, Absolutely. it's a really interesting time. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so you just well past my engineering <laughs> right? with all those numbers. I'm I'm nowhere near understanding any of that. There's problems. There's yeah. problems. Okay, I like that. That's good. There's problems. We're but, getting but, a quality <laughs> transmission out. I know. Right? I know. But, but you know, like every generation, we've got a new uh, uh, higher quality coming out, mm. right? Um, from from this, from from my point of view, from a theoretical point of view, what I'm interested in, you know, is there actually a peak quality? Will we actually reach peak quality at some point in time? I don't know the answer to that, um, but what I do know is that the next format that will come out will challenge uh, the the size that we have at the moment with 4K, and it'll be another bigger format of some sort. And then the engineers will get together and they'll over a period of time sold for that and then we'll go for another bigger format. That seems to be the, the, the evolution of, of content. So, you know, I'm, I love a great uh, experience with the best quality content possible. Uh, but what the internet has also proved, which is, which is fascinating, is things like Charlie Bit My Finger, which was absolutely lousy quality, is that it can be extraordinarily popular as well. For completely different reasons, just simply. Well, Nintendo SD. Well, there you go. The, yeah, yeah. Gaming systems that you go. What? But I, it's super popular, right? It, there you go. Exactly. So there's, you know, it's it, it's a it's a fascinating world that we're living in. It, I think it just becomes more and more fragmented as we go forward. And I think you guys both touched on it earlier. And it's a matter of how do we take all those different formats and and create some sort of standard around it, uh, or, or or how do we standardize? The content going forward, so that uh, so that if I've if I've got a screen in front of me, ultimately what I want to do is I want to see content on that screen. So how do we get that content, whatever format it's in, 
onto that screen efficiently and uh, uh, and without too much cost. I, think. I, yeah. I have to wonder about that, though. I, I, I mean, there's a big debate even whether or not in broadcast on your screen you, you actually see much of a difference between 4K and, and HD. I was about to say the same thing. And, yeah. and, well, I think 4K is going to happen because it's, it's, a, it's a good enough leap and, and eventually, you know, it'll become standardized uh, from the point of view of what everybody's doing production in. 8K? For broadcast, I can see it for mastering. I can see it for film. I can see it if you want to extract a, a beautiful sub still out of it. I can see it for if you want to capture a whole stadium and do a region of it. But I have my real doubts whether or not we're going to see for a very long time the adoption of, uh, of, of 8K or anything beyond that yeah. in, in content creation for the mainstream. Well, if you look at HD pickup from SD, it was faster. Than 4K pickup, yeah. and I think it's gonna tra yeah, yeah, yeah. trail off like that. So we're near peak quality. Yeah. <laughs> then is that how you think we're near peak quality? Can't, you're, you're getting to the, at the I don't front care, side. I don't care quality. Well, I don't think it's about yeah, no, no, but I'm, I'm, resolution. I'm I don't think it's about resolution. So I think it's really right. We're talking about resolution only here. I don't think it's about resolution. I think it's about you know w w what what we've experienced as we're incrementally over years. You know, you go yeah. to 4K and we went, oh, you, we're with you. It's like. It's pretty good, but I, you know, I mean, most of my screens are HD until I get to 17, and then over that, I start to care, or my TV, I start to care. But in general, it wasn't really that important at the start. But once we added wider brightness range, it went, whoa, right? I mean, you really started to get a big sure. difference. And sure. then once you added, so we've, we've just released this zone backlight, and we didn't really know what it would end up improving until we saw it. You know, it's like yeah. you, you develop it, you think it's going to be yeah. great, and you know, the TVs are going that direction, what does it really mean for us? What happened, we got this amazing kind of, just a nudge of a depth of field on the screen. Right. So it was nothing to do with resolution, right? It gave, we had gradations of shading that we could show, you know, a flower where you could see the oranges and the darks and the shadows actually come to fruition, which is what the standard kind of pixel resolution in 709 squashed everything. And you got this, it's like music, you know? You know, uncompressed has this depth to it and, and records have that, vinyl yep, have that yep, depth to yep. it, but then MP3 squash. So the image is, is following the same path. And when you see that depth increasing, resolution becomes irrelevant yeah. in that. I mean, oh, basically, right? So I think you're right. I don't think 8K, I think 8K with this, you know, screen monitor improvement yeah. might give you that experience, some specific experience like a, yeah. Expanding a 4K to an 8, on an 8K screen is not the same thing as having to produce to 8K. Correct, correct. And I, I think as well, it's the quality of the 4K picture that mm. we're going to be talking about more, like the HDR, the wide yeah. color gamut, but potentially the frame rate as well. I yeah. would prefer in a lot of action movies and things like that. 24 or 240. 60, 240, <laughs> yeah, 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 things yeah. like that. And, and let's make, if you want photorealism, mm. part of it is going to be the frame rate for action. Yeah, and, and everyone's saying that, you know, BBC's pushing that in, in Europe, you know, obviously a leading thought leader. We've done just an announcement with Dolby Vision, they're all about temporal data at 240 frames a second. Um, the head, the CTO of Sony Pictures, who's a good buddy of mine, he's, he's had like hundreds of millions of dollars that he's pumped into laser sights, recreating kind of temporal information with cameras panning, but they're, they're, they're doing it at like way more than 240, maybe four times that, almost a thousand. Wow at multiple cameras and then they're pulling out this amazing stuff from panning cameras over the scene where they're not really focusing like we are on people. It's kind of this fluid, lots of data. And then AI will come into that, right? Sure. Where they go, construct me a, you know, a, scene, a, uh, a story from all of this data. So I agree with you, the high frame rate is a really big endeavor. Way more interesting than, than 8K. 8K. Yeah. yeah, so four times the res ain't interesting, but four times the frame rate is very interesting. Yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff about the quality. But what about the immense formats? I mean, talking about VR and AR as well. Uh, I know David uh, uh, Rossi is very active in graphics with uh, yep. with, uh, with yeah, I can tell us a little bit about that. Well, let's, let's, talk about, let's make sure we're clear on what we're talking about with virtual augmented reality and virtual sets. What, what, when, we're, when we talk about augmented reality uh, is we're talking about putting green screen behind people and putting virtual information in front of people and, and doing that potentially in a photorealistic way using gaming engine technology and things like that. From that point of view, that's a hot area. There's a lot of really fast development going on. We're bringing in from the gaming engines are really starting to, yeah. to make a big difference in broadcast and, and the story that we can tell. If on the other hand, what you're talking about is 
virtual reality yeah. where there, you don't look in the direction, there is no direction as to what direction to look in and you're sitting in the stand somewhere and, you, and, and you've got a, a, a headset on. Uh, I personally, if, if you want a sound bite, I don't think a format that makes you look like a dork uh, <laughs> is, is going to necessarily have widescreen acceptance for, for the, the broadcasting experience. And if, if I look to my, to my right to see if my wife is watching the same thing and she, I can't see her and she can't see me and we can't see the popcorn. I don't, oh, I, yeah. I, I think VR yeah. is going to be as successful as, as 3D. 3D. I was yeah. going to say the same thing, right? It's so like the new 3D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a new non, yeah, non 3D successful. 3D is going to come back again, isn't it? It comes back every decade. I mean, well, isn't, isn't VR the that anyway? Isn't it just the next 3D, right? Um, augmented reality, from our perspective, we're trying to capture the quality so that guys like you can stick it in easy, yep. you know, and, and that data helps, helps you do that. Love augmented reality, I think. It's going to be very important to be able to go, like, let's say we shoot this and then I'm like, when we all had our products with us or something like that, it's like, you know what, I've got an update, I'd really like to, you know, flip that product yeah. in. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think product placements, all that kind of thing, advertising, yeah. there's a lot of really good stuff to happen in augmented reality, but not, not really virtual reality, I would yeah, say. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm with both of you guys. I don't like wearing the headsets myself. Yeah. <laughs> however, however, uh, there, there are some amazing experiences you can have with uh, virtual reality. Just uh, if you want to look like a dork and do some amazing things. Well, I mean, I'm sure the venture I, capital I, I, guys that funded it <laughs> are really happy with that nice experience uh, no, you're having no, with no return. Gaming, from, from a gaming <laughs> point of view, I mean, uh, uh, VR does Oh, the industry. Oh, yeah. Gaming? Yeah. Totally yeah. different. Yeah. Totally, yeah. totally get that. Yeah, they're kind of friends over a network anyway, right? So they're sitting yeah. there by themselves in a room it's most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we did, uh, so we went to uh, a fairground or this, this guy came came to a corporate party that we were at and he had a fairground basically the VR fairground and and you could do a bunch of things like go on roller coasters and and you really did feel just as sick as you normally would <laughs> yeah. on a roller coaster even though you're just sitting in a chair like this I mean quite extraordinary what it can do to your to your mind and your brain so um, you know Never say never. It's, it's it's still early on in, 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 in VR and AR days. I see the, the is, is it uh, like a is it like a epidemic? You know, like I people get actually, you know those. I, I don't know. There must be a bunch of. I probably have watched a movie. I can't remember which one, but where you know it becomes almost like a drug addiction or something, where these people are going into mm -hmm. these alternate worlds and then forgetting their own. You know, that's what it feels like. Yeah. It could end up that it's like this. Oh, I love it so much, and I'm getting these sensations I can't get in real life. So I'm gonna. Yeah. Right. But, but our business, from the point of view of content creation that isn't gaming, is telling a story. That's right. It's all of it, whether it's news or even sports, you're telling a story, and the story is from a perspective, mm. and because that's that's what the director is supposed to be able to do. If if you're gaming, you're telling the story. You're, and therefore, you're, moving you're around in those it. sets is all so, is all so right. That's where the yeah. division really happens. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, and with the AR, of course, you've got also you can leverage all the. Um, investment from the gaming industry as well so oh, yeah. yeah yeah I mean it's amazing things like that Unreal Engine looks yeah. spectacular yeah it's amazing and they're just gonna keep it's, it's a bit scary because if they turn their guns you know we're gonna have to stay ahead because because yeah. uh, they're gonna get they got a lot of money I mean they're massive markets oh, we've got the Unreal Engine on understand uh, yeah Voyager augmented reality products. the yeah. difference though is it's what we do is we do the value added. We say, is that in a MOS workflow? Is that is that going to be using proper data that we use from our data What your sources? customers already How's, know. What's yeah. the workflow mm -hmm. going to be? How are you going to control this in a live environment? Yep. These are all the sorts of things that we do that I don't think the gaming engine Of really course, cares about. to value add. No, 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 definitely not. Yeah, so uh, starting from Philip, uh, last question for, for all of you. What's coming next for content creation technology and what's, what your company is your company planning for? Uh, what's coming now for content Another general question. Uh, look, uh, I think uh, m more and more um, cognitive services are going to yeah. come down the road. Uh, more machine learning, more uh, AI. Uh, we'll, you know, it'll, it on it's only going to get better. Yeah. Um, we were, uh, we, we, we adopted um, transcribe very early on, uh, a f um, number of years ago, and you know, just they're, they're, they, they seem they seem like very simple things. But punctuation—people don't speak in sentences, 
Uh, and then, and then all of a sudden, you know, punctuation only just really started uh, uh, last autumn, which is it, it, it's we're very, very early on in terms of the cognitive services and the machine learning that's behind that. So, I think there's there's a long way to go, and, it, and it'll be really exciting times over the next couple of years. David. Uh, in the, the slide of production uh, where, where we live, uh, I think we're going to see, it's interesting, people talk about convergence. They, they you know, it's all going to be one great IT world and, and uh, I think what's really going to happen for the next while is we're going to see fragmentation. Yeah. We're going to see people producing in HD, in 1080p, in 4K, in, in uh, HDR, uh, with, with, with which flavor of HDR mm -hmm. and wide color gamut, which keeps <laughs> or, not, getting, yeah. or not, which keeps getting forgotten in the conversation. And, uh, and we're going to be seeing people using compressed IP and uncompressed IP. We're going to see people that are going to want to be doing it in, in purpose-built boxes. And also, because of the efficiency mm. and the cost, we're going to see people wanting to be doing it in, in general compute platforms. They're going to want to do it on-prem, but they're going to want it in the cloud. They're going to want to be, be able to virtualize they're going to be wanting every single thing all at once, and they're going to be wanting it sometimes inappropriately mm. for things that don't match. They're going to. I think we're going to. Be, we're heading into an area where the engineers are uh, are, are sometimes following hype mm. and marketing from our from our uh, from the manufacturers more than Absolutely. what is the engineering solution for this right now and what is the most cost effective effective way. And and when we talk about broadcasters, and this is NEB. Uh, these guys actually have less money, not more. Now, yeah. And, and, and I think... Yeah, they're not going to upgrade their infrastructure in a hurry, right? I'll they're going to sit on it for as long as they can, I call get it as the much long out tail of, of the broadcasting yeah, 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 yeah. I think a third of the world is still broadcasting in standard definition, which is an embarrassment, actually. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we watch it in Australia all the time. It's like, it's, guys, HD exists. I mean, yeah. it's not even that hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you've got a 4K TV watching SD. Yeah, yeah, How crazy yeah, yeah, is that? The yeah, pixels yeah, are like this. The bowl doesn't have to be fuzzy. <laughs> so we're going to get to convergence, but I think we're going to go through a huge mess along the way. Complexity, yeah. 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 Absolutely agree Jeremy? with... Yeah, absolutely agree with that. Where, where I think it's headed is that, yeah, definitely from our perspective, you know, we, we kind of, we stop and let the, we're moving to the computer, right? So it's all software. I'm really happy about that because I came from software originally. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, what is software? Well, it runs on hardware. So if you're a software guy and you really understand it, you're really making hardware. You just use maybe other people's hardware to make it run. And so I think software is a big, a big future, yeah. and we're he heavily investing in, in that. Why are we investing in that? To connect more to the great things that are happening on computer and server land, and which leads to an automation level of, you know, w w we've categorized necessarily, um, last year we went public and we had to explain a lot about our company, right? So we've categorized social, pro video, entertainment, and broadcast for us is in that pro video, but up the kind of difficult end of it. And if, if you look at those three, we can automate just before you, right? It becomes much harder because there's a lot of um, difficult things that your engineers are, are, are pulling off, which is you know, amazing and it's great stuff. But there's a, only a certain number of group of engineers that can achieve that. And we're looking to automate everything under that so that that becomes you know, a much more attractive scenario for people who really want to do it. So you, you keep that kind of broadcast, you keep that production high level stuff in the hands of the people who understand it. and then. You get a mirrorless camera, you put a ninja on top of it or it's integrated or it's a dongle or something, it gets the information, it's streaming at 5G at really good quality H.265 with all the curves applied to the right thing that's going to be on the other end or at least Dolby Vision that queries the TV and says, what are you capable of, let me send you that. And then the cloud analyzes it, sends you back five different color grades, cuts, copy, the whole thing, you go, oh, I don't really like that, bit of human input. Finished. Now that is a great pro video wedding kind of person. That is a great high end influencer social media person who's gaining traction with their with their fan base. And then if, when you go into entertainment, that's the bottom end of a Netflix production, right? Where they're pumping out five thousand of them a year or something at under a hundred grand budget. So that's what I'm. That's what we're focused on. That's what yeah. we see the big that automation of everything under you know maybe up to a three camera kind of shoot. Everything above that, you know, we don't re we're not really that interested in because we want that commoditization and move quickly to the automation that could happen. 
yeah, your vision for the future. Thank you very much for that. For very interesting insights and a lot to learn from me, for me as well. Uh, thank you very much for listening. For more information, please visit the IBM website. Thank you. Thank you.